it always feels a, a bit funny at this point in the conference when, when there have been so many great conversations already to say welcome. But welcome, since this is the first time that we all gather together uh, for uh, the 33rd uh, Patristic Medieval and Renaissance Studies Conference. And uh, once again, I am uh, mindful as we gather of, uh, of the founder of this conference, Tom Lasanci, and, uh, and all the great work that he did for, uh, for 29 years running this conference, and, uh, uh, and all the people who have uh, made, it, um, made it tick so far. And that would include you, uh, because I, I was, I've been telling people today, it never feels right until people are actually here <laughs> and listening to papers and giving papers and participating in the conversation. I never quite believe it will happen until it does. Uh, and here we are again, and it has, in fact, begun. And uh, I'm just so delighted to see you all. Um, before I go any further, there are a few announcements that I wanted to make. Um, first of all, immediately, well, immediately, after our conversation, uh, here uh, uh, this evening, this afternoon, um, we will have a, a wine and cheese gathering right out in where the registration desk is. Well, they'll clear that, reset it. You'll never recognize it, um, but they'll have you know the door will be open so you can enjoy the uh, the fresh air. We've got a, a lovely warm evening for uh, um, a drink or two. Um, that will be at, at begin around six. If you need to get back to the train or to campus, uh, the, the van that we've, uh, we've been running will run back to campus. There'll be a van at 6 o'clock. And if you need to get back sooner rather than later, the van will leave at 6 o'clock from the uh, hotel lobby up, you know, this odd arrangement here, on the third floor. <laughs> uh, they will leave from the center lobby there. So 6 o'clock. If you want to hang around and uh, have a glass of wine and uh, enjoy some conversation and then go and make your way to the train, uh, th we will have the van again at 7. So 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock uh, in either case. Um, I also encourage you to uh, try out some of our, uh, uh, our local venues for, uh, for food tonight. Um, Anna has been kind enough to include um, a great list, and I, I approve heartily of the list of restaurants she's assembled. Um, so I encourage you to uh, to to uh, check out what the main line has to offer. Um, uh, if there are cars, if you if at the wine and cheese you have a car and you'd like to bring some people along with you, uh, just make it known in conversation that you have a car. Okay. Um, if you'd like me to sort of try to connect people and you want to tell me rather than say, I have a car, will anyone go to dinner with me? Um, <laughs> uh, I'll be happy to do that. So if you wanted to let me know that you have a car and uh, uh, would, would be interested in, in gathering resources in that way, please let me know. Um, okay, is that that? Yes. On the whiteboard out in the lobby, uh, due to complications of travel, well, I think we all know what those are like, um, the session that would have taken place, session 10 on uh, Duns Scotus, which was to have taken place today um, with uh, wonderful papers by Cynthia Nielsen and, and Thomas Feeney, um, well, only half of our panel was able to make it at the last minute uh, today. So, uh, so we've been able to reschedule it for tomorrow morning at 10.45. Uh, and I, I'm pointing that out, A, because I, you know, that, that's a major change. You, may, uh, you, you ought to hear those papers if you can. Um, and the, the other reason I need to announce it is that the room that we were able to get uh, to make this change is, it's a lovely room for a paper. Uh, some people who have been veterans of the uh, conference will know it. It's the Montrose boardroom which is a lovely room with a beautiful table and very stairs through the dining room and into the, the old, uh, the mansion portion of, uh, of the complex here. This is the conference portion, this is the conference wing, that's the mansion wing, and so there'll be a bit of a, a, of a journey to get there, so uh, be thinking about that. I will uh, make sure that we have some of our uh, graduate assistants sort of posted to make sure that people can find their way. And I just, uh, I'd hate to have the fact that it's uh, a little bit of a walk keep you from, uh, from hearing that session. So I encourage you to make your way. And we'll make sure that you get there if you uh, are willing to set out on the journey. Um, all right, so much for the business. Um, our plenary theme 
the angel and the muse, inspiration, revelation, and prophecy, um, really comes about out of thinking through what it means for all of the variety of cultures and languages and uh, epochs uh, that, that we gather under the PMR uh, label uh, from east to west, uh, north and south. Um, what the cultures that we study here and maybe even hope to learn from share is in some ways they are deeply scriptural cultures. And if you have a culture that's imbued with scriptural traditions, then, then how does one on that basis think through uh, where that, that, uh, that scriptural presence stops and one's own poetic inspiration begins? Or is that even the right question to ask in such circumstances? Uh, what is the relationship between inspiration and, uh, of beautiful work and, uh, and revelation? Uh, so this is the, the theme that we're, we're contemplating. And as the, the, uh, the conference uh, team gathered to think about this, we found that there were at least two loci that we thought we would be worth exploring. One, the figure of Dante. Dante, who is, as we've heard already in several papers already, quite bold in his claims uh, about uh, his claims to inspiration um, in the strong sense, uh, even to revelation and prophecy in his own work. And the other locus uh, that we thought of was uh, the, the Quran, where in the Quran, it's the very often, it's the very beauty of the Quran that is a testimony to its divine origins. Right? It's the very beauty of the poetry in the Quran, of the poetic voice in the Quran, that is a testimony to its divine. So here we have a coincidence of, of uh, aesthetic and, and, re and revealed. Right? So uh, these will be the two loci that we'll explore together in these plenary sessions. And I'm looking forward to this conversation so much. Um, I'm happy to uh, introduce the introducer. My colleague at Villanova, uh, Dr. Andrew Matt, uh, will introduce uh, our first speaker. Um, and he has a particular special reason for doing so. So Andrew, why don't you come forward and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Well, it's, <clears throat> it's an honor to uh, introduce our plenary speaker and, uh, and a special honor for me because it was under Professor Brenda Shilgen uh, her care that I wrote my dissertation at the University of California, Davis. Um, Professor Brenda Shilgen is presently the director of the Comparative Literature Program at the University of California, Davis. And uh, just this past spring was the recipient of the UC Davis Prize for Undergraduate Teaching and Scholarly Achievement, a big uh, prize. And she also a few years earlier, won the Outstanding Davis Teacher Award, um, 2001. So she's she's well known as a teacher, but her scholarly work is is uh, amazing. Uh, her specialties um, are the European Middle Ages, the Bible is literature, Dante, and Jewish, Christian, and Muslim relations in the European Middle Ages. Her <clears throat> most recent book just came out. Um, is entitled Heritage or Heresy, Destruction and Preservation of Art and Architecture in Europe. This latest work is a study of iconoclasm, ravaged images, artifacts, and structures in Europe to destroy or redesign communal memory. Her other books include Dante in the Orient, which came out in 2002 and is presently being translated into Arabic a book on Chaucer, Pagans, Tartars, Muslims, and Jews in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, Power and Prejudice, The Reception of the Gospel of Mark, and another work on Mark, Crisis and Continuity, Time in the Gospel of Mark. And she's also co-edited uh, a number of works, five other books, which I won't mention. Um, but again, I'm very uh, delighted to introduce Professor Shulgin, both a uh, kind of a meteoric uh, rising, uh, I must say, even though I'm 
not of that stature. I mean, I, she's, she's really, her production is amazing and her energy uh, as a scholar and her passion is, is uh, contagious. And on campus, she's really taken UC Davis by storm. So um, her, her title of her talk today will be Christian Poetics, Dante, Prophecy, and the Urgency of Time. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brenda Shilgen. Generous introduction. And first of all, I would like to thank Kevin Hughes very much. This is a lovely place. I wish I had been here before. It's an absolutely splendid place to be, and I love the fall colors, uh, something I do not get to enjoy in California. <laughs> and I want to also thank uh, recognize Bob Hollander, who actually was the first person to ask me to be on a panel at Medieval Academy uh, some 20 years or so ago. It was a while. Thank you. And thank you, Andy. And of course, thank you, Peter Hawkins, without whom I would not be here, <laughs> since Peter is supposed to be up here. So I am here in his stead, uh, a meager. <laughs> replacement. So um, I began to think about this uh, paper in the spring when I was asked to do this. And um, I've been thinking we're sort of having this return to formalism. So I have been thinking about Dante's aesthetics, his poetics. And this is sort of connected to that. But obviously with Dante, you can never talk just about <clears throat> formalism you always end up having to see the relationship between formalism and something more, a lot more. So let me see how this goes. It seems a banality to say that concepts of time are central to Christian theology. Yet this fact constitutes a reality that demands repeated attention. Indeed, Christian poetics from the patristic period to Dante engage a complex understanding of time that reaches back to the New Testament. Matthew's Gospel recounts Jesus' sublime words about time at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. These brief remarks make the present the critical time. Set your mind on God's kingdom and his justice before everything else and all the rest will come to you as well. So do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will look after itself. So this talk is going to explore how the multiple dimensions of time Dante uses in the Commedia contribute to creating his unique version of Christian poetics. The locus classicus for Christian ideas on time, of course, is Augustine's extended discussion in Book 11 of the Confessions, where he addresses God and his eternal atemporality. It is not in time that you precede time, he writes, but from the summit of the eternal present, you precede all the past and all the future exactly because it, i.e. time, is the future, and once it has happened, it is the past. Augustine begins this meditation on time, one of the major themes of the Confessions in Book One, where he identifies eternity with perfection and time with the imperfection of existence, as he writes to God, you are always the same, and all the things of tomorrow and afterwards, and all the things of yesterday and before, today you will achieve them, and today you have already achieved them. In the vast metaphysical elaboration of Book 11 in the Confessions, Augustine expands on the implications of this meditation on time, for him measured solely by his interior being. In te anime meus tempora meteor, in you, my soul, I measure time. Again, speaking to God, Augustine writes, a permanent time would not be time. So what is time? Time, he writes, requires that someone experience it. 
If nothing happened, there'd be no past. And if nothing were to happen, there would be no future. And if nothing existed, there would be no present. Augustine's brilliant innovation, breaking from Platonism, is to make eternity ontological. And secondly, to have today refer to the moment in which the divine eye pronounces. Augustine thus does not just reproduce the classical topos, that time is evanescent, as in Plato, Cicero, Plotinus. Rather, he insists in one of the most famous quotes of the Confessions, neither future nor past exist, and only improperly do we say that time is in three, past, future, and present. But more correct would be to say that time is three in this sense, present of that which is past, present of that which is present, and present of that which is future. Yes, these three are in a certain sense in the soul and do not see how they, and I do not see how they can be anywhere else. The present of what is past is memory, of what is present is perception, and of what is future, what is awaited or hoped for. God's eternal sameness, whose years do not come and go as humans do, for God's single day is also his years, and his day is not today, because his today does not cede to tomorrow, is the metaphysical ground of the divine entity. For God, today is eternity. Thus, for the divinity, past, present, and future do not exist, for only the present actually exists. <coughs> Similarly, for Augustine, within the human soul, the present is also the past and future. Augustinian notions about time, like the Pauline eschatological understanding or the announcement of Jesus' public ministry, hokairos excuse me, peplerotai, the time has arrived, gives the present an urgent imminence because the present is the time of the divinity and the moment for immediate human action. As Giorgio Agamben writes about Paul's letter to the Romans, restoring Paul to the, his messianic context recognizes how Paul defines time as honin kairos, the time of now. Eric Auerbach's argument about figura, which he traced from Tertullian to Dante, demonstrates another approach to time that appears in Christian texts. Figura, the word Auerbach uses, I, I would say, instead of allegory, to distinguish the Christian symbolic imagination from its Greco-Roman pagan legacy, he shows, includes multiple notions of time. The historical or biblical event itself, which becomes figural in later historical times, and which points to yet future times, that is to the teleological future to which the past and present lead. Albach's approach to Christian time unfolds in his theory of figura. Writing against the 19th century tendency to rigidly divide the multiple layers of meaning in the Commedia that had led to making Virgil almost strictly an allegory for reason, or inversely, to emphasize a personal human quality for Dante's Virgil, Albach presented a more complex view of Dante's allegories in his path-breaking essay, Figura. He argues that there is no choice here between historical and hidden meaning. Both are present. The figural structure preserves the historical event while interpreting it as revelation and must preserve it in order to interpret it. Stating that the Christian development was, the great, was of the greatest historical importance, he writes, this, I always loved the fact that Auerbach was a German Jew who had to leave Germany as an exile, who had this amazing insight into Christianity. That is the most remarkable thing about Auerbach. It brings tears to my eyes to think of him as an exile writing this kind of thing and being an exile because he was Jewish. 
<clears throat> the strange new meaning of figura in the Christian world is first to be found in Tertullian, he writes, who uses it very frequently. Albach focuses on how Tertullian's interpretive system, and specifically as applied to interpreting Hebrew scriptures in relationship to the New Testament, made persons and events of the Hebrew Bible prefigurations of the New Testament and of its history of salvation. But Auerbach continued, the Hebrew Bible was not diminished by such a figural interpretation, for Tertullian refused to consider the Hebrew Bible mere allegory. For him, it had real, literal meaning throughout. And even where there was figural prophecy, the figure had just as much historical reality as what it prophesied. Tertullian's and similar Christian versions, uh, origins or Augustine's of this incarnational interpretive theory would inform Christian exegetical and poetic practices for the forthcoming millennium. In this poetic or symbolic system, time as a human dispensation is linear, possessing a beginning and end with numerous historic symbolic figures that make past and future present. A simi similar figural imaginative system, which my latest book happens to deal with, also appears in visual arts, because Christians certainly had visual art before the Constantinian conversion. I mean, the evidence now is very, very persuasive of that. Um, at least by 200, evidence based on archaeological remains now indicates Christians had begun to develop a unique symbol system and artistic traditions. Adapting pre-existent visual decoration and imagery from the pagan worlds around them, both Jews and Christians in the early centuries of the first millennium were developing a system of iconographical and symbolic representation suitable to their ritual practices and biblical narrative traditions. A transformation that would reflect the radical shift of meanings in symbolic communication in the late Roman Empire. A similar exercise of the figural imagination as Tertullian had applied to biblical interpretation appears in these early examples of Christian art, <clears throat> with images like Jonah and Noah's Ark or Sheep and Shepherd, for example. Historical reality and figural prophecy were both literally true and biblical narratives from Hebrew or New Testament invariably conveyed these multiple meanings simultaneously. Albach wrote that the shift in the symbolic imagination that took place at the end of the ancient world wrought a definitive rift between the symbol and what he termed the figura, for the latter relates to an interpretation of history. Indeed, it is by nature a textual interpretation while the symbol is a direct interpretation of life, he wrote. Seeing the change from myth and symbol to figure and history as a massive cultural shift that took place at the end of the ancient world, Albach understood this as a uniquely Christian teleological view of history in which this eternal thing is already figured in earlier historical events. Of course, Christian writers and artists, through the medium of the tradition of the Latin poets, Virgil, Ovid, Horace, and Lucan, for example, as evidenced in Dante, also brought the symbolic mythological system of the ancients into their Christian imaginative projects. Aubach had brilliantly identified one facet of the figural imagination that he showed Dante had adopted in his monumental poem. But this is by no means the singular way in which Dante uses the Bible or that his Christian poetics unfolds. Important as this allegorical or figural system is, particularly in its connection to an incarnational view of history, it remains still only one of many of Dante's specifically Christian poetics that following others, uh, <clears throat> okay, specifically Christian poetics. Another dimension of time that interlocks with Christian poetics is uh, apophatic expression, that is, beyond language. For in an effort to convey the notion of transcendence, ordinary language becomes not only inadequate, it fails to convey any precise meaning. 
this negative theology tentatively or momentarily takes the poem and the poet out of time and into eternity, that is, beyond time and space. Dante frequently turns to apophatic language, especially in Paradiso, and I'm, this is a quote from Pseudo Dionysus, to honor in respectful silence the hidden things that are beyond me, Pseudo Dionysus wrote in the celestial hierarchy, in order to hint at the divine entity. Michael Sells identifies three aspects of what he labels classical Western apophasis. The metaphor of overflowing or emanation, which is often in creative tension with the language of intentional demiurgic creation. Disontological discursive effort to avoid reifying the transcendent as entity or being or thing. And a distinctive dialectic of transcendence and immanence both together, in which the utterly transcendent is revealed as the utterly imminent. The most obvious example of this recourse to this negative theology, and specifically the effort to avoid reifying the transcendent phenomenon, is in the naming or unnaming of God, for which, as in the Bible, Dante's polyonomastic divine naming vocabulary includes dozens of words and expressions, the diversity itself destabilizing the potential for any affirmative or concrete communication. Another feature of this apophasis in the Commedia, particularly in Paradiso, is the poet's repeated references to failed memory, failed intellect, and inability to speak, combined with the impossible task of language Indeed, the poet invoking Paul at 2 Corinthians 12, 2 to 4, I know a Christian man who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up as far as the third heaven. And I know that this same man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard words so secret that human lips may not repeat them initiates the Paradiso with one of these references. Um, I read it in English. I have been in the heaven that most receives of his light and have seen things which whoso descends from up there has neither the knowledge nor the power to relate, even though he's doing it, <laughs> because as it draws near to its desire, our intellect enters so deep that memory cannot go back upon the track. Such apophatic rejection of language unveils how the poet avoids reifying what he sees and hears. Behind Dante, of course, is an entire tradition of medieval mystical writers like Bernard of Clairvaux or Richard of St. Victor, allusions to whom or borrowings from whom occur in the last cantos of the Commedia. As William Franke puts it in explaining Dante's apophatic expression about the final vision of God, it is beyond language and moreover configures itself precisely as the beyond of language. It literally the one without speech. Nevertheless, this ineluctable failure of language to express its object, a failure which is given maximum relief by constant reiteration of the ineffability topos, paradoxically, that connects to apophatic dialectic in which transcendent imminent overlap, particularly in Dante, can be found in his nature imagery. For when he frames similes and metaphors from nature, he often evokes eternity in the sense of repetitive and eternal action. For example, these are obvious, the sun rising, the spring arriving, winter departing, birds singing, buds opening, leaves falling. The imminence of nature links it to eternity or the eternal present, 
even though, of, although Dante clearly adheres to an Aristotelian hierarchy of ethics and of human creation, poetry becomes one of his means to probe the limits of philosophy. Here, metaphors and similes can become the vehicles for challenging Aristotelian hierarchies and for breaking away from Auerbach's teleological historical trajectory and for breaking into the imminent present. In this poetic process, in other words, through metaphor and simile, the eschatological future and the prelapsarian past can exist in imminent actions within the simile itself. For example, if we look at Dante's metaphors and similes in which he shows the working of nature, we see that in the making of poetry, in contrast to philosophy, poetic analogy allows him to think his way into the otherness of beings. To understand this idea, in other words, to enter into the other through the poetic simile. To understand this idea, we must probe the precise status or function of the similes or analogies in the poem that seem to challenge philosophical hierarchies. For classical rhetoricians, simile and metaphor function almost exclusively as forms of ornamentation, again in radical contrast to early Christian uses. In the Aristotelian, Ciceronian, or Quintilian rhetorical tradition, metaphor is mere substitution, a way to see likeness between two distinct phenomena, our language trick and a graceful addition to the poem. According to the rhetoricians, metaphor, simile, and neologism in this tradition function primarily to increase aesthetic appeal. Although metaphor had more functions in ancient poetry, including to clarify, to render central immediacy, or to link the vehicle with unexpected associations, primarily these still keep the image within a, within a tropological function because none are associated with semantics, thus suggesting they lack that central feature of the Christian figural imagination that Auerbach noted its link to meaning. Let us see how this might work out in Dante's poem. Excuse me. If metaphor is a denotative tool that poetically remakes nature, as Paul Ricoeur has argued, how a poet uses metaphors or similes could raise some significant questions about knowledge of and relationship to the natural world if they're nature images. For example, if the philosophical and theological system remakes nature into a rationalized hierarchical order, does it follow that the similes or metaphors become equally hierarchical? In Franciscan theology, because the world is God's creation, obviously that's in all Christian theology, but Francis really puts that in the forefront, Nature imagery would not so much mirror divinity, but through language it would evoke a sign of God's creative and loving power. With this creation theology in the foreground to consider some of Dante's creature similes, we'd want to ask whether likening scattering sinners to frogs and an angel to a snake that frightens them off, or angels to a swarm of bees associates the frogs with the chthonic and the bees with the celestial. Or in fact, if the simile is not an equation or substitution, but rather because the vehicle cannot substitute for the tenor, does it become the means to put into play properties that were not until the poetic moment, until the analogy signified? Indeed, does the simile in fact grade creatures placing them in a hierarchical order, or are they, in the Franciscan language of Bonaventure, vestiges or imprints of God's creative power, signs that point to God's work, or vessels of revelation? In other words, metaphor offers us this insight, to perceive, think, feel, even perhaps be or become like another. It allows us to experience entrance into the other 
in a sense, capturing a rapturous condition of mankind beyond or before hierarchies, dichotomies, and binaries, identifying this approach to metaphor with post-Cartesianism and Heidegger, the Italian philosopher Enzo Malandri, called this the, symp the sympathy aspect of the hermeneutics of the analogy. Close reading of the Commedia's similes and metaphors shows that in some cases, Dante's use of nature similes in the poem both reveals his interest in natural phenomena and at the same time allows him to represent a non-anthropocentric view of the non-human world. Revelation, Dante suggests through imagery, is in nature, in the imprint of God, yes, but in divine action through nature. This is not a reworking of Plato's forms that are shadows of the ultimate truth, nor is it pantheism. In the Franciscan terms, as expressed in Francis's poem, Cantico delle Creature, and Bonaventure's philosophic elaboration, nature is living incarnated proof of God's act of love through creation. The animal similes in Paradiso, which are overwhelmingly bird images, with the major exception of the bee simile that occurs in Canto 31, reveal how this works. The bird similes in Paradiso, unlike those in Canto 5 Inferno, invariably describe the purposeful action of single birds. Furthermore, in contrast to many similes and metaphors in Paradiso that seem to attenuate the relationship between what is figured and the language to express it, another central feature of Dante's apophatic Christian poetics. In the case of these similes, the natural event or action clearly signifies the simultaneously transcendent and imminent moment. I'm only going to give you one example here. I happen to have a huge discussion of this coming out in modern philology. But I'll just give you one example. Uh, in Canto 20, Dante makes an analogy between non-human creatures and blessed humans. Likening the eagle's speech, the blessed, to a bird song, Dante suggests that we can know blessedness through a bird song. Like the blessed, the lark sings and then falls silent because its desires are completely satisfied within its own sound quale allodetta che in aere si spazia prima cantando e poi tace contenta e l'ultima dolcezza che la sazia tal mi sembio l'imago dell'imprenta dell'eterno piacere. Like the lark that soars in the air, first singing, then silent, content with the last sweetness that's it's to die for. Mm. <laughs> this is such a, such a poet. <laughs> like the lark that soars in the air, first singing, then silent, content with the lost sweetness that satiates it, so seemed to me the image of the imprint of the eternal pleasure. This lark's sweet satisfaction with its own song conveys a hint of heavenly bliss. Here Dante uses a description of imminent nature as an analogous to transcendent blessedness, a sublime example of nature's detachment from the desires of humans. While the simile ce celebrating this animal blessedness with this simile, Dante suggests that non-human creatures resisted or avoided the fall from grace, and that the living in the present actions and being of non-humans offer us a view into the timeless or eternal prelapsarian condition of unconscious blessedness. And I could go on, but these similes are always in the present tense, which is the eternal tense. The present, you know, the sun revolves, the earth revolves around the sun. That's an eternal tense. Our present is the eternal tense. However, another notion of time is also evident in Christian poetic practices. Finding its source in the Bible, prophetic utterance breaks out of historical and typological or figural time into of God's eternity 
and human time as an ontological apocalyptic moment is paramount because memory and expectation are modalities of the present, Augustine too confers time's urgency on the present. For Augustine, our present, with all its segments of time, is the pale and insufficient reflection but eloquent reproduction of the eternal presence of God. Prophetic speech with its attention to the present time, on which I'm going to focus for the remainder, is in many ways opposite to Dante's recourse to apophatic language and to Auerbach's idea of the poet's use of the figura. Although in another of Auerbach's brilliant essays, Dante's addresses to the reader, he showed he did understand this dimension of the poem. While the whole poem is in one, se in one sense might be identified as prophecy, there are also occasions when Dante very specifically adopts the voice of a prophet, thus bringing to the forefront the urgency of time. Auerbach's essay argued, that's his addresses to the reader, that Dante's addresses to the reader were unique innovation, since this rhetorical device does not exist in classical epic poetry, and nor are there precise parallelisms, he claimed, in medieval vernacular literature. For Auerbach, they possessed Virgilian sublimity and Augustinian urgency. For as in patristic and biblical addresses to the reader, Dante spoke with the urgency of a prophet. Of course, Hebrew prophets possessed a special assigned role to educate, having heard and seen through a visionary experience what must be conveyed to the Israelites with present urgency. Full of enthusiasm for the divinity and submitting to the divine call, the prophet accepts the order to make manifest what he has seen and heard. Dante may not be quite parallel to the Hebrew prophets, but he does share certain traits. One, he's alone. Uh, he's persecuted and exiled. He has turned towards what will happen if, as historical person and as another world pilgrim, he is separated from the normal hierarchies that rule the earth. He sees his society in a state of political, moral, and social crisis, and is totally decadent. Invested with a political, moral, religious mission, he speaks out against the world's woes. In these instances, when he takes on that role specifically, like Ezekiel, that other poet of exile before him, Dante speaks straight out, even if he still uses enigmas or allegories. As Peter Hawkins has written, was Dante's poem the kind of rapture described by the prophet Ezekiel? Clearly, the poet wanted his readers to believe that he had been raised by the hand of God. Still here, chosen as it were again, like Ezekiel had also been, the poet shows his investment in the contemporary history and politics of his world, reveals his personal loss, and unfolds the prophetic purposes of his work. Let us draw the analogy with Ezekiel first, and then look at those moments of heightened urgency in the poem when Dante takes on this prophetic role and is confronted with why he must write his poem and speak straight and direct. Radical personal loss due to exile falls to both pop poet prophets, and in both cases, this loss is presented directly and not in figures. Ezekiel proclaims, this word of the Lord came to me, O oh man, I am taking from you at one stroke the dearest thing you have, but you are not to wail or weep or give way to tears. Suppress your grief and observe no mourning for the dead. I spoke to the people in the morning and that evening my wife died and next morning, I did as I had been commanded. Immediately thereafter, the Lord tells Ezekiel that Jerusalem and the temple are to be destroyed. And after he receives the news, he will recover the power of speech and no longer dumb, you will speak with the fugitive. So you will be a warning to the people 
and they will know that I am Lord. And this direct speech about exile, about loss, and about prophetic purposes, of course, parallels Paradiso 17, when Caccia Guida, uh, a mediator between the divinity and Dante, tells Dante that you will lose, you will leave behind you everything you love most dearly. Like Ezekiel, also Dante is told by his great-great-grandfather that he must speak out, tutta tua vision fa manifesta, like let everything you've seen be manifest. And in Italian, the word used for what he's seen is indeed vision, again linking the poet's experience with that of a Hebrew prophet. Ezekiel's text, which merges prophet <clears throat> and person when Ezekiel eats the scroll of the Lord, follows from the initial vision of the four creatures later repeated in the Apocalypse of John. That's 1, 4 to 11 in Ezekiel and 4, 6 to 8 in John and in Purgatorio 29, where Dante insists John is with him and not as their watchman so he can confront them with their failures, he's also told he would be unable to speak and so rebuke them. Ezekiel, like Dante, however, is a post-exilic prophet. Thus, it is not the past that matters now. Heinous as the trial resulting in exile may be, it is the post-exilic search for perspective and insight over what has been lost both personally and politically, and what can be done to understand what has happened that concerns both prophet poets. Thus, it is precisely after the desecration of the sanctuary and the death of Ezekiel's wife that Ezekiel is told to speak straight out, to offer the oracles of the nations. Telling of the devastation of Israel and Judah, he follows with a sophisticated review of the coming demise of all the countries neighboring Judah, the closest Moab, Ammon, and Edom, and then Tyre, Egypt, Babylon, and Assyria. These doom oracles for the nations are expressed in terms of because and therefore, and in fact, probably reveal effects that have already been realized, that have already happened. Ezekiel becomes the prophetic medium, the watchman, through whom God warns his pe people for turning to his own situation, that is, that of the Israelites, he writes, this word of the Lord came to me, O man, say to your fellow countrymen, when I bring a sword against a land, its people choose one of themselves to be their watchman, and if he sees the en enemy approach, he blows his trumpet to warn the people. And God continues, I've appointed you, O man, a watchman for the Israelites, and you must pass to them any warnings you receive from me. If I pronounce sentence of death on a person because he is wicked, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that person will die because of his sin. But I shall hold you answerable for his death. I shall hold you answerable for his death. However, if you have warned him to give up his ways and he persists in them, he will die because of his sin, but you will have saved yourself. Thus Ezekiel's text has God not only assign the prophet the role of watchman, he also specifically and straightforwardly tells him that he will be held responsible if he does not speak out to the unrighteous. Every man will be judged according to his deeds, the voice of God promises. And for Ezekiel, the central righteous deed is to speak out against unrighteousness upon the charge to do so. So let's now turn to Dante's adoption of this very similar prophetic voice and what it has to do with the urgency of time. First, there are several ways in which this happens, but I'm going to first talk about the mouths of others. So in the mouths of others, Dante has Hugh Capet's 83-line condemnation of the Capetian line for the gloom it has spread over Christendom, the seizure of land and power throughout Europe, the disrespect and captivity of the papacy in Purgatorio 20. 
and avarice that propels the actions of his family and descendants. This excoriation follows Dante's personal apostrophe to the ancient wolf's voracious avarice. Accursed be you, ancient wolf, who have more prey than all the other beasts because of your hunger endlessly deep. Then we have the prophetic and revicious conclusion to the pageant in Purgatoria, una putana sciolta, uh, con un gigante right besides her, who were kissing each other, a thinly veiled allegory for the capture of the papacy by the French, along with other biblical references. The invective in Paradiso from the against his own order, the Dominicans for corruption. Saint Bonaventure against his order, the Franciscans for failing to live according to the model of its founder. Saint Peter Damien against clergy who failed to follow their vows. Caccia Guida against contemporary Florence. The Eagle against all the corrupt Christian monarchs. Beatrice against Boniface VIII and Clement V and Saint Peter's profound excoriation of the usurpation of Il Luogo Mio. The utterances of these revered figures against contemporary corruptions, as St. Peter most forcefully states it, he who on earth usurps my place, my place, my place, which in the sight of the Son of God is vacant, has made my burial ground a sewer of blood and of stench. Puzza. So that the perverse one who fell from here above takes comfort there below. Dante makes this angry indictment triply forceful by giving a threefold cosmic perspective to the usurpation of the papacy, pulling the three realms above earth and down below into the importance of the events, using the harsh rhyme Vaca, cloaca, placa. He ties the early event, Peter's martyrdom, to the urgent present, for his place of execution has become the sewer of the contemporary papacy. Reflecting Dante's rage at papal politics in the late 13th and early 14th centuries that led to the transfer of the papacy to Avignon, the poet identifies ecclesiastical corruption and divisiveness with the sewer of hell. The Monarchia had already demonstrated Dante's passionate engagement with contemporary political concerns. But in the Commedia, the several occasions when the poet's voice erupts into the poem convey a strident urgency about the present, reserving some of his harshest language in these instances in an unmediated polemic. In other words, speaking in his own voice, he adopts a prophetic voice to address current disorders, will not be surprised with whom or what he singles out for attention. The papacy and curia, and curia, France for its aggression and complicity with the papacy, and of course Florence for its various sins. For example, in Canto 19 Inferno, he speaks directly to attack the Simonists as Rapaci of Le Cose di Dio. O Simon Magus, O you, his wretched followers, that rapacious prostitute for gold and silver, the things of God, which ought to be the brides of righteousness, now must the trumpet sound for you, since you are in the third pouch. He initiates Canto 26, Inferno, in Ezekiel fashion, with a direct invective against his native city, whose fame spreads throughout hell, and for whom he prophesies pending punishment. Godi, Fiorenza, poi che sei si grande, che per mare e per terra batti l'alli, e per l'inferno tuo nome si spande. Rejoice, O Florence, since you are so great that over sea and land you beat your wings and your name is spread through hell. In Canto VI, in uh, Purgatorio, when Virgil meets Sordello across 1300 years of separated time, Sordello says, O Mantuan, I am Sordello of your city. And as the two Mantuan poets embrace as fellow citizens and poets, Dante takes this opportunity to launch his longest invective against his own contemporary Italy. 
In contrast to this camaraderie of fellow citizen poets, Dante addresses his present Italy personally, i.e. said of Italia, for its descent into lawlessness and violence. Lasting for the rest of the canto at 75 lines, again in Ezekiel fashion, speaking directly, if not concisely. These are the least poetic parts of the poem, but they're essential to understanding Dante's poetics. Um, again, in Ezekiel fashion, speaking directly, if not concisely, he excoriates Italy for a host of ills as a slave, in of pain, house for whores, lawless, leaderless, abandoned by German emperors, more busy with acquisitions, crawling with tyrants while turning at the end to Fiorenza Mia. He blames the city for wasting its wealth, changing its laws, coinage, customs, and even people. It sounds a little too familiar. <laughs> but <laughs> thus, having adopted the immediacy, urgency, and conviction of the Hebrew prophets, and more particularly that of Ezekiel, which he integrates with the traits of apocalyptic otherworld vision, mediated through guides, expressed in terms of eternal consequences. Dante also, like Ezekiel, has his interlocutors give him the authority to speak on the knowledge he has gained through his visionary experience. Indeed, they charge him both with the responsibility to speak out and they emphasize the necessity and consequences to him should he fail to follow these injunctions. The three figures that confer this responsibility have ascending figural value. First, Beatrice, who has only just appeared in the poem for the first time before the patch, unless that's right, about Canto 27, Purgatorio, uh, that would return yonder. As has been remarked, the guarantee of eternal salvation contain, contained in Beatrice's words cannot fail to shock us, for only the elect enter the eternal city, and Dante has Beatrice confer this future elect status on him. But it is at the following the charge we have an example of very direct speech. It relies on one obvious and typical Dantean metaphor, heaven as Rome and its citizen as eternal Romans, and one allegory, the chariot, chariot which is the bark of the Roman church in its present condition. But besides this, Beatrice speaks so simply and directly that this, this barely seems like poetry. She tells him in sim simple terms, quel che vedi, fa che tu scrive, write what you see when you return from here to there. Like Ezekiel's Babylonian captivity, the capture of the papacy emerges as the concern of the moment that calls forth Dante's writing. These are, not, these are prophesied events that have, of course, already occurred, but Dante, in giving Beatrice his charge to write about them, makes them of pressing contemporary importance. Dante poet, again, in the tradition of both prophetic and ap apophatic, no, ap apocalyptic, <laughs> apocalyptic texts. Now I lost my place. Um, what did I do here? Just a minute. Um, where the phrase tu nota is common, has Beatrice in the following canto authorized the poet's duty as she simultaneously promises that the imperial seat will again be occupied and the church will recover, although neither prophecy came true in Dante's lifetime. Again, however, the concern is of immediate importance in Dante's political vision, and he is enjoined to write of it to the world, live the life that is the race to death. Caccia Guida, Dante's great-great-grandfather, is the second figure to confer the responsibility to speak out on the poet. And in the second case, the prophetic language is even more direct. Again, in chiare parole e con preciso latin, clear words and precise diction, Dante is told the bitter truth that di Fiorenza partir ti convene. So from Florence you must depart. 
in contrast to the clarity of the actual words of his great-great-grandfather, Dante introduces Cacciaguida's assignment with a far-fetched simile that describes him as, and I'm going to give it to you in English because it's very difficult, the light wherein was smiling the treasure I had found there came flashing as a golden mirror in the sun. This kind of simile that is commonplace in Paradiso is an example of how apophatic discourse avoids reifying the transcendent experience and, and being for bringing the concrete speech of Caccia Guida together with this vehicle, a metaphorical enigma, smiling light, packed into a mirror image, Dante receives his reflections and analogies, that, but the speech is specific and clear. A conscience dark, either with its own or with another's shame, will indeed feel your speech to be harsh, but nonetheless, all falsehood set itch is. For if at first taste your voice be grievous, yet shall it leave thereafter vital nourishment when digested. This cry of yours your little cause of honor. Again, like Ezekiel in the clearest language and the sentiments of Jesus' words on the, at, at the Sermon on the Mount, set your mind on God's kingdom and his justice before everything else, and all the rest will come to you as well. So do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will look after itself. Each day has troubles enough of its own. Dante is told to make known the perfect system of ecliptic urgency. In the tradition of the poet eating the divine words, as in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, the prophetic words Dante will utter, utter will give vital nodrimento, living nourishment, once digested, despite their initial bitterness. Also, as with the prophets, Dante's own honor is attached to this charge to set all falsehood aside. Finally, in ascending order of the poem's journey and of the importance of the figure, St. Peter is the last to confer the prophetic role on Dante. Once again, an excoriation against the contemporary papacy that has moved the papal office to Avignon becomes the cause of the pressing call to speak out. Addressing Dante as son, Peter to hide what he does not hide. And you, my son, who because of your mortal weight will again return below, open your mouth and do not hide what I hide not. In this paper, I've sketched some aspects of Christian poetics and how they connect to concepts of time. Focus on the prophetic, speaking out aspect of Christian discourse expands from the well-established Christian innovation of the anagogical and allegorical imaginative process and from the mystical tradition of apophatic unspeakableness. But more important here is how all these connect to multiple concepts of time. The allegorical and typological make time teleological with history interpreted as a temporal linear process. Thus, the incarnation has made it possible to reinterpret history, particularly sacred history, in time. The incommensurability of the divinity expressed or unexpressed in apophatic discourse, on the other hand, is an effort to break into a transcendent eternity that is always imminently present. Prophetic utterance makes the present the privileged time of action, for it is the moment when the time has arrived and all that is occurring now requires attention, the utmost dedication and sense of urgency. Let us return to Augustinian notions of time and the call to prophecy that Dante clearly accepted as his ultimate vocation. Assigned the role of poet-prophet, told to address the most grievous failings of his moment in history, Dante evokes Augustine's idea of divine existence in an eternal present in his poem. In his figural imaginative project, he rejects distinctions among historical times and persons to make all time eternally present. The events of his poem transpiring in eternity, 
even though the poet is living in the present. Dante's urgency of time breaks into this eternal present almost as a rupture in the poem when he personally addresses contemporary concerns, has figures from the dead scorn the moral failures of the moment, or when he is told directly and concretely that it is his prophetic responsibility to expose the moral violations of his time that are creating political and social turmoil across Italy and Europe. Here the eternal present becomes the imminent moment of the poem, the apocalyptic moment that the poet must seize in the charge of the poem itself. So, io non pedessi gli altri per mie carmi, I do not lose the rest because of my songs. time for uh, conversation. So uh, if you're content to uh, uh, feel the questions on your own. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. If anybody has a question, <laughs> I may not have an answer. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if I could sort of step back away from Dante for a moment uh, and go back to your earlier discussion of metaphor mm -hmm. and other Mm -hmm. an approximation of the language that you use. Um, and this seems like it be, might be right to me, um, but in reflecting on this in the past, and, I, and I'm sort of coming at this from a philosopher, it seems like much of 20th century philosopher, philosophy has been trying to get out of this um, trap of imminence that mm -hmm. modern mm -hmm. epistemology has laid for it. Uh, and and there's this there's this there's this struggle to know the other as the other. Mm -hmm. Think of mm -hmm. Levinas or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone right. Particularly interested mm -hmm. in this. And there have been critics that suggest something like analogies still fall short because ultimately we're just imposing what we already have on the other and know them in those terms. And so I was sort of wondering in what way metaphor is unique about the way in which metaphor mixes two unlike terms to somehow give us a third term that deepens our understanding. And, uh, and I'm, what I'm sort of wondering is, is there a sense in which what metaphor does is really, the third thing it gives us is really reducible to the two original things. And if that's the case, then it's how, not is, helpful. It do, how is it doing anything that normal, different than normal language? Right, and right. If, but, if, but if it's not doing anything different than normal language, then maybe it suggests us that normal language already is in contact with otherness. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, maybe normal language is more interesting than we ever thought it was. So, oh, you <laughs> philosophers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buried under the weight. <laughs> too much talking. No, no, it's <laughs> good. But I was just wondering in your own reflections if there's a way in which you might be able to give us some insights on how metaphor really is unique or doing right. something different well, or I, is everything metaphor. Right. I am I actually more interested in the simile than the metaphor okay. actually. Well, that's but fine. <laughs> um, so but still metaphors are also analogies. That's that's the first thing I would I want to say. The second thing is I, w I want to think more deeply about this because for example as I said, you know, classical rhetoricians don't seem to see the metaphor or the simile as anything more, I'm redu being reductive here, but to decoration. And that's definitely not the case with the Christian symbolic system and the Christian simile. I mean, there's something very different that happens, and you really see it in Dante because he's going to the epic tradition. He's got these, ep you know, these, these epic similes that you know, um, move way beyond um, merely decorate. You know, they're definitely not decorative because they're load they're laden with meaning. So that's the first thing. Those two things I would say. And then after that, see, the, the piece I have coming out is really about animal similes, and I wasn't thinking about others. But I I think you're raising questions that one need. I think it can be elaborated, and one can talk about all similes. Um, in the poem, all similes in Paradiso, ex expanded uh, similes, in which you have to see, because of what's it's, what it's being likened to, that you can see that he wants you, he, the simile is inviting you 
to enter into the otherness of the being of what is in that, in that, um, in, in, in the analogy. Go ahead, Peter. Two things. One is the simile is very upfront about inviting you into another world. Yes. Right? Like or as. So exactly. It's a setup there. The other thing is the, um, the angel, they can't be thinking of Homer or Virgil. No, they're definitely not. similes are so fraught with meaning and right, layers and right. I mean, Dante learned something, right? Yeah, I agree, although, you know, because you, you and I were talking, I'm teaching Virgil right now, and I'm looking at those epic similes very carefully, and I just see that Virgil takes us into the world of polit history and therefore into, into a certain kind of time. He moves us into a historical time, whereas Dante does a lot more than that with his similes. He goes way beyond historic. He, he takes you into, in other words, the simile can actually take you into the where apophatic discourse might take you, you know, the imminence in the transcendence. That's something that happens there. And that through the analogy, you're able, I mean, it's very complicated stuff here. Through the analogy, you're perhaps able to enter into that otherness, have a hint of that otherness, a, a, a way of understanding what that otherness, and in this case, in the Paradiso, this blessedness, what it is. Because we don't know, uh, and, and he apparently had a bit of a sense of it at some point, and he's able to convey it. Uh, invariably through these analogies or through this apophatic discourse. I don't know if that helps. No, that's helpful. I, I think there might be a sense in which there's a whole... The, the Christ, Christian contribution is not just one of language, but a sort of metaphysics behind all this. Exactly. That eminence is never sort of pure eminence. It's, it's always related exactly. to something exactly. infinite. And exactly. if that's the case, then that sort of opens up any statement sort of opens up a sort of web of relationality to right. other statements. That's right. It's just nice to be at a conference like this and be able to talk about things like this. I couldn't say this out loud at my institution. <laughs> say, Brenda, you need to go to a rethinking camp. <laughs> Something wrong with you. You've lost control. <laughs> yeah. I am at the risk of oversimplifying this. I was just telling you the idea, uh, going back to the, uh, to the, the notion uh, what's the difference? I mean, the, the question that is postulated what's the difference between ordinary language and metaphor of poetic language. Is it possible maybe to conceive of poetic language as a way of heightening the function of ordinary language to an intuition of, uh, of almost and then uh, you're left with this uh, apophatic experience, mm -hmm. which confronts you with the notion of truth, perhaps the only confrontation with truth which we can have as a human being. Well, that's where he gets at the end of the poem. He does. He gets to that point. But In other words, of heightening the effect of language to the point that language itself becomes useless. Mm -hmm. It's a paradox. Right, and that, in a way, answers, I think, your question, what is it beyond just the two terms that's there? It's, it's the relation, it's, it's that in which the two terms are related, which neither of the two terms can ever tell you. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I like very much your comparison of the uh, effort to draw out how Dante is a, like, like a prophet. Um, <clears throat> but in... The, uh, in the Hebrew scriptures, the prophets often have to pay a very high price. Um, Ezekiel loses his, his wife, Hosea has to sleep with a, uh, a prostitute. Um, we know what happened to Jonah. I think Jeremiah tried, tried not to speak, and it was like he was being burned up inside. Um, but for, for Dante, he's lost his way, and becoming a prophet is a sort of a way to get his life back. And um, in uh, Robert Hollander's session earlier, it seems like uh, writing down what he's seen is his, his opportunity to, to be crowned with the laurel. So, <laughs> what, what's the, you know, what's the cost of being a prophet for Dante? He's lost everything. He has lost everything. I mean, he, he, he has capital punishment. He lost everything. So, you know, I mean, he, maybe he'd like to get the laurel crown, but goodness. I don't think he's writing the poem just to get the laurel crown. 
I don't think that's his only am I mean, Bob doesn't think that either. That that's his only ambition. Like eternal happiness or, or something, if, if not an actual crowning thing. He wants to save his immortal soul. I mean, I'm sorry to put it bluntly. <laughs> you know, if I, I'm gonna, if I don't do this, I'm gonna lose every tree like that siren. He's gonna lose his, he's Ulysses, he's going down. I mean, that's an ongoing theme in the poem, you know. His, we have all these examples of failed poetry. You know, poetry, you know, the, the kind of poetry he shouldn't be writing. You know, there's all of these retractions going on all the way through the poem. So this is taking on in Paradiso, he, and he, to have Peter tell him he has to do this. I mean, obviously, he wrote the poem. He told Peter to tell him to do that. But, <laughs> but he, you know, and in ascending order, he, he believes he is going to lose his immortal soul if he doesn't do this. At least that's the pretense of the poem. I have to take him at his on face value. It made him thin, he said. This poem's made me pretty thin over the years. The yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this temporality question in relation to, uh, to two different senses of magnanimity that are being are played against each other, especially in sec the second canto of the Inferno, right? You know, where Virgil's representing pagan magnanimity. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there's this sort of later tradition of trying to understand what kind of virtue that would be in a Christian context that I think is embodied in Beatrice there. And it has a lot to do with the sense of the relationship to time. Mm -hmm. in term. I mm -hmm. wonder, as I've been trying to figure out as you've been talking, like how, what's a good, what would be a good way to formulate that? I wonder whether it might be something like this. <clears throat> in a kind of pagan understanding, the human relationship to the eternal is fundamentally an erotic relationship, like in the image of, of the sire, I mean, in the purgatory. Whereas in the Christian understanding, it's, um, it's in terms of vocation, of being called, and of, in a sense, that relationship to the eternal, especially as understood in pagan philosophy, is really about you ceasing to be you, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. become emerging with that element of the eternal that's pure intellect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, in, you know, when Beatrice comes down, when, when Virgil's recounting that, right, she comes down, and says, look, you've got to do this. And Virgil says, okay, I'll get to that right away. But, but first tell me, what is the cause of mm -hmm. the fact that you, right, this, this philosophic inquiry and the causes, which, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which in a way is rising above time. Mm -hmm. Time as this kind of confining necessity. Whereas she says, look, let's not talk about that now. You do what Gotta I told do you it to now. do. Now it's a matter of urgency yeah. in Canto One already. Mm -hmm. This is really urgent. He's going to lose, he's losing his life. So the urgency is right, and there's this divine intervention, basically, because of the urgency of the moment. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a question I have no answer for, it, um, and, I, and I don't know how others here can help me, but, but you, you, you cite Paul Ricoeur's uh, The Rule of Metaphor, mm -hmm. And thinking of Ricoeur and his, his own philosophical trajectory, I mean, writes the real metaphor and then eventually is led on to, to write uh, his works on Augustine with time and narrative. Um, have, you, have you thought about that relationship in his, his own writing? In, in Ricoeur's? Yeah, into this discussion. Well, I'm only as, you know, somebody I consult in that sense. But I, I hadn't actually ever, maybe you've thought connected his discussion of metaphor to his discussion of Augustine on time. I mean, I haven't ever put those together. But. Nor have I, I didn't know if anybody else. No. But the, I mean, it is interesting that the metaphors are in the present. You know, that that is extremely important, as blah, 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 but this action that is described uh, in the the meta the, the similes I'm talking about are in the present, mm -hmm. and they distant in the sense that it describes something that goes on all the time, like a bird is feeding its chicks. As the bird, you know, early in the morning, the bird gets up to feed its chicks. 
kind of thing. So, yeah. Uh, just I know about the record uh, thing. I know in the rule of metaphor, record talks a lot about the difference between simile and metaphor. And it thinks that metaphor is somehow more basic than simile because simile is already you, you, you state some, some metaphor such as um, well, you know, there's a live wire, mm -hmm. and then you can turn it into a simile, um, and you turn it into a simile, so you're doing some sort of conceptual, um, you're having a conceptual understanding, sort of mapping on how this mm -hmm. is supposed to work out. Mm -hmm. So he thinks the metaphor is perhaps more immediate to the inexperience in a simile, because a simile is you sort of one step removed, you just sort of... Right, but the metaphor is like plain language. Yeah, yeah, it's not. So... Because all words have got to have some, there's got to be something a metaphorical in the word because we're saying that this is a desk. So, do you see what I mean? We're naming it a desk, and in the sense that makes it a metaphor. I, am I crazy saying that? <laughs> Ultimately, it does, but a simile doesn't. It says, no, this is like blah, blah, blah. So, so many times, and this goes back to the first question again, in the Paradiso, especially, where there's a metaphor. It's not that a metaphor has failed, but a neologism occurs. And I'm thinking, um, Robert Holland, Hollander, had he gone on for a few more minutes and a few more lines, there's the, the, the metaphor Glaucus. Mm -hmm. And right beyond that is the, the neologism Razumanar. Right. And, and, and that's a perfect example where that's not plain language, it's not metaphor, it mm -hmm. follows metaphor, and it somehow embraces it and mm -hmm. explains it fully even mm -hmm. if we've never seen the word before. So language that's not plain language, that's invented language that has become somehow understood by us because we're engaged in the reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most of those neologisms in Paradiso are also in the present. They're reflexives and they're in the present, which is well, very... It's in, in infinitives, so mm -hmm. that's very significant as well. Right. Um, I am Italian, and thank you very much for your paper. First of all, I enjoyed very much your reading, so uh, sweet, sweetly uh, Dante. I'm, I'm used to hear Benigni, because <laughs> reading Dante is such a strong uh, way to pronounce mm -hmm. Italian. And I enjoyed very much your very, very sweet way. Thank you. Dante. <laughs> Thank you. And the second thing is this, um, returning on the difference between metaphor and similar or comparison. Uh, I agree with you with the explanation of comparison or similar uh, about the present. Of mm -hmm. course, Dante uh, was trying to explain what to do in the present, and the similar is a way to explain what to do. The urgency of time is on the present. Metaphor uh, is a way, a way to develop language to see the future. It is also something to understand better the past, while the similar, I think, similar is for the present. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. We can develop a language mm -hmm. only with metaphors, mm -hmm. not with similar, similar or with plain language. Mm -hmm. The neologies uh, we were talking about, mm -hmm. uh, it is something um, dangerous, of course. They are not metaphors, they are not similar. No, no, it no, they're not. A way that I think uh, Tuscan language, uh, I am living now in Tuscany, I'm not uh, from Tuscany, and I enjoy the way uh, Tuscan people are creating language with uh, so beautiful sounds and now here. <laughs> and, but this is similar is for the present, and the urgency is to how to uh, understand our present, our problems, and how to um, intervene in, in, the, in reality while metaphors are for the future, for something new. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. I think that there was not interested in, in the future. But no, he was in, obsessed in with the present. To, yeah. the present and, uh, to do a comment on the past. Mm -hmm. So similar are the best way to, mm -hmm. to have an action on the present. Thank you. Talking about the future, um, could you comment on sort of his playful uh, um, sort of uh, playing with time in the inferno in moments where he's he's the prophet, for example, like when Francesca says that Caina awaits mm -hmm. uh, the oh you know, I see and mm -hmm. you know like the um, misunderstanding that Boniface has arrived and um, I had another one on my mind uh, the one uh, Corso Donati mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you know he's foreseeing where he's going to go and how he's going to get there. Have you thought about that in? No, I mean. 
Bob says that the whole poem is about justice, but certainly in Ferdinand, if that's the main subject, and that's just a way of Dante sort of using his, that kind of prophecy. I'm not talking about that kind of oh, prophecy yes, I, I here. I'm talking clearly. about biblical type oh, prophecy, um, because those kinds of prophecies don't really, in the long run, they're not that ultimately important compared to the collapse of Europe in the 14th century. I mean, absolute collapse. But yes, I mean, I think it has to do with the justice of God, you know, and he is, yeah, he is mouthing what he considers to be the justice of God. He's taken that role on. So in that sense, you could see all of Inferno fitting into this argument that this is, you know, a prof prophetic revelation of the justice of God. Really? So you have, for example, um, one that's Kanwa, the name of Ola, which means his, God's promise, was a deed done. Mm -hmm. And it's referring to the day of judgment in the future. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it, it sort of, in a way, encapsulates or describes that moment, that eternal. Actually, I wasn't going to contribute on that. Oh. No, I just actually wanted to ask a question following up on that. Is it, is it a, because I don't know Arabic, is it a, a simple past tense or is it a, a perfect tense that has some sort of sense of overlap with the present. No, it is actually um, the past. But what happens with the overlap comes with the present and the future. And that's not so often used when in reference to the life. It's more like when the plant's talking about people and, and things. But um, I have noticed, and um, this is just an observation, I have a lot of study that I've made, that when referring to future, sort of as a lot of future, as divine future events, they're referring to Past perfect is used. I'm sort of wondering whether we might have put ourselves in a recurring box. <laughs> you know, that, that is to say, a, a visible sign that makes present what it symbolizes, uh, right? T to make those words present to someone else would be a means of making the vision of God present to someone else. And, uh, metaphors might be a tool that we use there, but I mean, really, it's something more than just metaphor, but I mean, it's, it's making it's making a moment of grace present in some way. So mm -hmm. uh, I just want to sort of throw that out there and see what, what you think. Getting me in trouble here. <laughs> well, yes, about the sacraments, but the question is, is Dante's poem a sacrament then? I, that's that's, that's what, what, what you're asking? That's what I want to ask her. Not, obviously not one of the I, I think that was... One of the seven sacraments. What I'm wondering is, because there's this sort of broader category of sacrament, right? Kind of pardon my, my philosophical idiom, but some kind of impressed species in the mind of his words that somehow embody this vision that he's had, right? W wouldn't those words, not merely to represent it, but to make it present to us in something like the same way that the prophet yeah. himself has that vision? And that seems to me, that the, you know, metaphor doesn't just quite, doesn't quite do that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's something more like that, like making God present to us. Are you introducing the notion of symbol? Well, I mean, I think I think in sort of traditional definitions of sacrament, symbol is present. Right? I mean, rather than just a sign, say. Um, I don't know how much weight we have to put on that, but I mean, it just seems to me that there's, you know, that I mean, part part of the reason why I think Lee's question presented itself um, from the outset is that it seems to me you're asking for metaphor to, to do something very profound, which is to make another present to us in its being. I'm not sure metaphor does that, but I think the sacrament does. Right. Well, I, I only was talking about the similes, very specifically about certain similes, not all of them, but certain similes in Paradiso, and not about metaphors. I, I haven't talked about, I mean, there are a lot of far-fetched metaphors which get you into the apophatic area uh, in, with Dante. Uh, but the, the similes are the ones that deal with this present, immin imminence, transcendence in the, in the uh, analogy. Yeah. Uh, perhaps the, 
the audience to which this is addressed, uh, since the audience is supposed to already know what it is that Dante is speaking about, it's not learning about, but being reminded about it. In the mm -hmm. same way that uh, Israelite prophets were not <coughs> creating for the first time, right. they were always reminded right. of, the, right. of, of the promises that right. they made and how they had failed. Right. Um, does then metaphor and simile function differently when it's simply reminding or illuminating what already should be held and known? and loved and believed by the people who are hearing this poem. Mm -hmm. That's something which my students sometimes find, is when they read Dante, it moves them uh, to a recognition, not to, a, to the illumination of what uh, already is there. Mm -hmm. Is that different than if you're trying to introduce something to a, to a mind that hears this, this poem? Mm -hmm. And that might be interesting. How do students, perhaps, who are not formed and shaped in a, uh, in a Christian mind, uh, how do they hear this poem perhaps differently from, say, a student in a uh, Catholic university mm -hmm. who may have come with some, uh, like perhaps Dante's original audience, some appreciation or, or attachment to what is being revealed? Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, in this paper, anyway, you raised a lot of issues about teaching and so on, but in this paper, I mean, I actually, when I talk about Dante adopting the prophetic voice, he's not using similes and metaphors. He's speaking straight out in really direct language. I mean, he might use similes or metaphors, but primarily he, it's just straight and direct. It doesn't, it's not even like poetry, whoever is doing it, whether it's Dante or, uh, or, um, or whoever is, is doing this. So the, there's that was one dimension of dealing with time in the poem. And then there is these, this question of similes. Uh, and, um, and I was talking very specifically about the similes in Paradiso, uh, the other, many of them, the otherness of, of being, um, to become the other. And you know that many of the neologisms exactly do that because they're reflexives and they collapse the difference between the actor the person who's doing things and having them done to them. It's the same. Inuyarsi. Yes, Inuyarsi. all of them, exactly. All, uh, many, many of them are like that, exactly. So I don't, I mean, in t terms of your question about students and dealing with all of this, they just are um, amazed by the drama of the poem. I mean, I think that's really what student, I mean, undergraduates love. It's just the most dramatic poem. This the most amazing things keep happening, and they come out of, you know, like, and it's, you know, there's apparent order to this drama, <laughs> which, which they love. So that would, and I don't talk about this with my students, time and, they, they, no. <laughs> I'd like to go back to the, the point about sacramentality, because that's what, exactly what I was thinking of when the question was first asked. And the thesis that <laughs> um, no, I, I do think that that's a really important point, this, this idea of sacramentality, where you can have a sign that is, that, that is that in some way shares in the reality that it represents. Human beings in the Christian worldview, especially this Catholic worldview that Dante is using, are not just of absolute other sons to God, but ideally they're created as signs of God. And I think Dante argues that Adam in Parties of 26 is a sign of God that also shares in God's divinity. He, uses, he calls Adam an apple. He calls him Pomo. And of course, the Pomo in the Garden of Eden is the apple that is attached to the tree. Well, if Adam is the apple, what's the tree that he's attached to? Well, we just had that uh, shortly before that in Parties of 26 with the, the simile of the Orto and the Ortolano Eterno, where you have the leaves attached to, attached to the Orto, uh, which in the uh, if you, if you take that from the subtext uh, in John 15, uh, it has to, it's probably Christ. That's what I would argue. So you have the, the leaves, or in this case the apple, that's attached to the tree of Christ. Christ, of course, is God. Adam shared in God's divinity. So he's the, he's the sign of God that also shares in God's divine nature. He is, in sacramental terms, sacramentum et res. He's the sign and the reality signified by participation. Uh, the tree, i.e. Christ fine in, in the John 15 subtext with the Orco in, in Dante's terms. And the whole point of the, the 
incarnation is to reunite in Christ the sacrament of man and the res, the divine reality, the divine nature of God. And so Dante, in the course of the Paradiso, or in the course of the entire comedy, but ending in the Paradiso, he's refiguring himself as, you know, into a Christ substantiation, which is the, the arising <laughs> concept of the transformation of the sign into the reality that it's signified. I'll go ahead and stop there. But <laughs> no, that's okay. I mean, that's <laughs> well, that's the the figural side of Dante's poetics. You know, that kind of allegorical imagination. That's what you're really expanding on there, very definitely. Everybody's well, pooped out. They're yeah, ready for a say, drink. <laughs> So, catch your breath. I think we've all earned a glass of wine now. And uh, so, uh, and again, right in the atrium here, uh, we'll have uh, wine and cheese for the next hour. Uh, if you want to catch that, uh, that first shuttle before that, I can't believe you would, but if you do, uh, it's 6 o'clock upstairs, so in about, uh, in about 10, 12 minutes uh, from the, the lobby, and otherwise 7 o'clock upstairs in the lobby. Enjoy. <laughs>